With COVID-19 testing and treatment in sharp focus, many states responded with orders and requests to health insurance companies that should help consumers through the pandemic. The Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act, passed on March 18, 2020, requires health insurance company to waive cost-sharing charges for FDA-approved COVID-19 testing. This law says that the cost-sharing should be waived for telehealth services, in-person doctor visits, an urgent care center, and emergency room visits related to COVID-19 testing. The federal law applies to health insurers that offer individual and group health plans. Before the federal law, many states were taking action to give consumers better access to testing treatment, early prescription refills, and telehealth. It is envisaged that many states will be requiring health insurers to waive cost-sharing charges for a coronavirus vaccine. We do have with us in the studio uh, public affairs analyst Achude Chika. Chike. Actually, it's Achike Chude. Okay, Achike yeah. Chude. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure. All right, let's get to it. The, there has been a lot of attention on surviving the pandemic, and this might be the best time to address the, you know, a, a lot of health um, insurance um, issues. So my question is, why this may just be the pivotal point of our health system in this country when we address, um, might this rather be a pivotal point for us to address the issue of health insurance? Yeah, I think it's a pivotal uh, you know, moment to address the issue of um, the totality of uh, healthcare infrastructure uh, in the country. Of course, uh, health insurance, healthcare insurance plays a very major part, you know, in making a healthcare, adequate healthcare accessible, you know, and affordable to most Nigerians. And I think that, I mean, that is the essence of that. Um, if uh, there's no doubt that um, uh, coming into this uh, COVID-19 um, crisis, that we knew that we had a very depleted uh, healthcare infrastructure. Um, of course, starting from the days of the military and then that very infamous a cool statement by late uh, uh, head of state about uh, our hospitals now becoming, uh, uh, you know, places of, uh, you know, uh, mere consulting clinics. Uh, some people would argue that it's gotten worse than consulting clinics, you know, over the years. And so the peak of uh, the dilapidation of our healthcare infrastructure was given, you know, credence by the fact that virtually uh, those people who are well-to-do within the political spectrum in the country found it much easier and safer to travel out of this country on health tourism. And uh, that was where we were until COVID-19 hit us. And of course, you know, there was uh, this sense of irony about the entire COVID-19 uh, situation because uh, those who would have taken the very first flight out of this country suddenly found themselves in a situation where they, they were sharing the same, they, they had created. to make do with what we, we had to face. So if uh, Nigerians died in the process, they would die in the process. If we did not have access to treatment facilities, they would not have Well, do you think it is strong facilities. enough, um, a strong enough motivation um, for, you know, a rejigging of the health sector, including the issue of insurance? It, it's uh, survival of the fittest, I think it is the first law of nature. So once a person's primary interest uh, is involved, there's always a tendency for him to want to do more. I mean, we get to the issue of healthcare infrastructure, look at the issue of education. If it is, you know, it's virtually impossible for the children of the elites and the politicians to leave this country for better education abroad, they will make sure that our educational system is fixed. If it is, you know, uh, impossible for them to get adequate healthcare uh, outside of this country, they will make sure that they will have you know, adequate healthcare uh, in Nigeria. And, and, and I will just give a, a very small instance. I think uh, we were told, uh, a true story, the wife of one of the civilian governors was pregnant, had a due date. And so I think they, and of course they had to fly her abroad. And unfortunately, I think the baby tried to, I mean, was a little bit stubborn. I came in a vehicle. And so they, there was no way they could fly her abroad. Within a matter of 24, 48 hours, they had made sure that one of the hospitals, the general hospital, the, the, you know, the special, one of the uh, teaching hospitals in the country was prepared. In fact, was in such a fantastic state to, uh, you know, prepare 
for her, you know, excellency to give birth. And it was, I think, a patient that now came in uh, much later. I was shocked that uh, the uh, state of a healthcare facility at the maternity ward could be this, this, this fantastic until somebody told her the story about how they were able to get this thing done. So this is what is going on. Now to the issue of healthcare. The reality is that, you know, there is, um, you know, uh, there, there, there is this healthcare reform, uh, you know, that, I mean, in terms of the law that was passed in 2014, you know, it had to do with pension as well as, you know, healthcare, uh, you know, uh, pension in, of, of uh, healthcare workers and all that. And so the government has been able to observe that in the breach. And it's not just something that is with the public sector in the country, but also the private sector all over the country. You find, this, you find instances where there are clear court guidelines on, you know, the issue of, uh, you know, uh, insurance, health insurance for medical practitioners and ordinary Nigerians. But in most cases, these things are not done. I'm aware, for instance, that uh, the Association of Resident Doctors has been in constant engagement with the Ministry of Health for, a very, you know, for quite some, for about two, three years now, emphasizing on the need to provide adequate health care insurance for medical practitioners as well as ordinary Nigerians. They have not been able to do that. In the last year alone, I think they lost about five, six doctors from across the country. Now there was nothing to adequately take care how can of we, this. How can, how can we go about um, building um, a health insurance system, getting it up and running um, in the quickest possible? Yeah, I, no, the, the first thing I think has been done, and that is the issue of policy. There's a policy in place that makes it mandatory. You know, and once it is a law, and that, uh, 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 in fact, this is a, once it is a law, it means that those people who are not ready to abide by the law are punished. No, so again, how, how, how yes. that, if it's, it's a law, but we still have an issue, we don't have it, so how can we make yeah, it happen? Because, I mean, over the years, we've had instances where, you know, government makes a law and somehow lacks the political will to ensure that this law is implemented in the first place. So I think it's about those people who have the desire, who have the political will, starting from the government, to ensure that people who are in breach of provision, relevant provisions of the law, are punished. Because once that happens, there's always that tendency for people who are watching from the sideline to realize that, look, they can't afford to also do the same thing. They will comply. You know, so this is, I think, is just the essential thing. The law is in place. And this law is as a result of, I mean, it's a product of serious discussions by so many people within the healthcare in, in, in industry and beyond the healthcare industry until, I mean, it was now you know, passed by the National Assembly. So you would expect that. But again, who are we talking about? Government institutions themselves are not, you know, also abiding by the laws of the government itself. So that's where the problem is. So I think a lot more pressure needs to be put by civil society organizations, by those, you know, practitioners to ensure that uh, they are forced to do the right thing. All right. I'm told we have the executive director, Nova Hospital, uh, Dr. Emeka Momo, uh, join us virtually now. Thank you very much for your time. Doctor, can you hear me? Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, quickly, um, we're almost out of time for this segment. How could health insurance um, have been made dealing with a pandemic like COVID-19, a more efficient operation, for instance? Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Dr. Meta Moma. Uh, I, I believe uh, that a, a big uh, issue like COVID-19 uh, within the healthcare sector can and could have been resolved if there was uh, access, uh, what we call universal access to healthcare within the, the Nigerian populace. Uh, the often question that is healthcare um, a right as a physical Nigeria or the luxury um, uh, has again been asked uh, by COVID-19. So if uh, the society valued healthcare as, uh, as a privilege, as an asset, or as a right, uh, we will sort of change our policies to encourage uh, from local government to state government to federal government to invest uh, significantly in uh, primary health care. So, and we, once that is developed, you get a pooling of funds that can uh, be able to spread across uh, uh, to essentially ensure uh, every populace in, in the country. It is doable. Universal health care is the way to go. Okay, quickly. Um 
what is your take on the ongoing agitation by resident doctors, clarity in the deductions that's been made, or, or a return of the funds that have been deducted from their salaries, and of course the issue of insurance. Is it enough for them to be uh, taking the choice to go on strike at this moment? I'm not sure. What, repeat the question, please. Okay, I'm talking about the strike at, um, being um, embarked upon by resident doctors in Nigeria. Uh, the issues range from the health insurance, uh, PPE, salary slash, and the likes. I'm asking, um, is there a reason justifiable um, to go on strike at this time? Uh, yes, I mean, I think... Uh Quite uh, honestly, it's a debate that uh, spreads across the most societies, even the developed world, where uh, there often needs to be a making decision between uh, the, the doctors uh, and their demand for benefit. And uh, because what they do is entitled to some risk. So um, it's, it's somewhat fair that if I'm going to endanger my life to save another life, there should be some measure of insurance, be it life insurance, health insurance, to guarantee me access to health care and uh, for my family as well if uh god forbid I, I i become ill you know and i can no longer be productive so i think these are all matters that need to be uh put on the table uh but uh, often enough it's uh the willpower to see the priority in negotiating with this body maybe now it's not the best of time to really go on strike because we need to sort of sacrificially uh serve uh in this pandemic period but again, I think uh, there needs to be a, a, a dialogue, a consistent dialogue, constructive, uh, to somehow change the policy and the policies of uh, the uh, government and its representatives to see healthcare more as a as a right of every citizen of Nigeria than a, than a privilege. All right, Dr. Emeka, thank you very much for joining us on the news. We appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, um, Achike. Your reaction quickly yeah, well, to well, you what see, you said. The doctors are aware that over 50 billion naira was contributed by the private sector, perhaps much more than that right now, you know, for the purpose of this COVID-19. About six weeks or two months, or over two months after the COVID-19 and the various lockdowns in parts of the country, PPEs, you know, personal protective in equipments have not been distributed to the doctors. Now, they also have a right to live as, 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 you know, as much as they, you know, they are doing their best to ensure that you know, uh, people, sick people, are, I mean, get well. You know, and so they, they, they realize that up to now, you know, not much has been done. Uh, the, 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 the monies, for instance, I, I'm not as sure as at the last time I, I, I got in touch with members of residents, uh, uh, certain resident doctors, I don't, not, not, no money has been disbursed to any of the federal you know, medical centers in the country or the teaching hospitals in the country. You, you understand? So they are aware that there's so much money. And if what, what other time, what is the most appropriate, appropriate time for the doctors to embark on a strike when they know that, like, as it is said, strike the iron while it is hot, that this is the only time they can get the government on the jugular. The, gov with God, the government needs these, doc these doctors at this critical point in time. And the doctors know that they can get some of these basic necessities that they need to do their work effectively from the government by you know, putting the government in this situation. Yes, so I think it's a strategic moment. The government needs to sit down and talk and need to really make sure that the, 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 the welfare or the health of these doctors are protected while they are trying to protect the lives of patients. I think it's only just. All right, thank you very much uh, for Thank your you. thoughts. So yeah. we'll be back with you in a bit.